Today on the Uncrushed podcast, we speak with the host of the Uncrushed podcast, James Buckley. We put him in the guest seat, the hot seat, uh, and really understand his personal background, his journey uh, from Miami to Tennessee, and some of the struggles that he's really endured during his life, and most importantly, how he's overcome them, and why this is such an important part and connection is such an important part of his recovery process, uh, both in his professional life at Say What Sales, uh, as well as being brand ambassador for Uncrushed. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncrushed podcast. And James, it seems like you're in the wrong seat. <laughs> I have been waiting to sit in this seat for a minute. <laughs> right. Well, my name is Tim Clark, and today we have put the host of the Uncrushed podcast, uh, James, in the guest seat. Yep. Uh, I think we've done a, a good few episodes now, and I think it's uh, important for our audience and the Uncrushed community to get a bit of insight as, as to the man behind the podcast and, and, and the man in general. Yeah. Um, so where to start? Why don't you just tell us all a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. I am James Buckley. You know me from the Uncrushed podcast along with Say What Sales. That's my personal brand that I created two or three years ago uh, just around sales and sales tips and advice and career choices and so on. Um, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I've lived in Tennessee, East Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains area for the last 13 years. Uh, probably the best move I ever made was getting out of Miami. Okay. And I, I know uh, when you interviewed me, we talked a little bit about the connection between us. That's right. Uh, so let's just start off with why is Uncrushed so important to you? I remember you reached out to me after we've been connected for some time and you talked about, hey, we should do this and create this podcast. Uh, wh why? Wh why is this so important to you? Yeah, so Uncrushed is important to me because I relate to its goals about mental health, <clears throat> specifically in the addiction space. Uh, I come from a background of cocaine addiction. Uh, if you've ever been down to Miami, you know that it's probably one of the easiest things to get in South Florida, and I developed a really bad habit. Uh, but then I, I, I changed my life. I, I made the decision to leave Miami and start anew somewhere else, and it was the best decision that I ever made. So when you and I ended up connecting and talking about this idea for Uncrushed that you had and this organization that you had started, it was a really easy thing for me to say, I love this and I want to be a part of it. Let me know how I can contribute. And I think that's when you and I started talking about the podcast. Uh, and fortunately, I had all the resources in the world just at that moment to be able to provide uh, a studio and a producer with great talent and an assistant to help with editing. And it just made sense. It was like all the pieces were falling together. Uh, and if you've, if those of you out there have ever been through recovery, you know that as you move through uh, and find yourself again, different things start to fall into place. And this was one of those things. And being able to dedicate some time out of my everyday routines to tell stories, get other people's stories, and help people that are going through mental health crises, uh, super important for me to give back to the community in that way. So what? let's start off with your personal experience. Yeah. You mentioned cocaine, addiction, yep. Miami. Uh, I know we share a bond around loss yeah, as well. We do. Um, so talk a little bit about your your journey that led to uh, you know the move from Miami. Yeah, my my exodus had everything to do with a uh, a pretty bad experience I had at, on the job. So uh, that back in Miami, I I was selling cocaine so that I could do it for free. Uh, if you if you know anything about cocaine, you know that you can never do enough. It just consistently. You know, feeding that a little bit, that a little something, <laughs> a little something. Yeah. Um, in any case, it, it ended up being a real problem for me, and I couldn't stop doing it. And I was, you know, I had developed like a, a two, three, eight ball a day habit in some cases. Uh, so one night around, I used to be a cook. I was cooking in the kitchens of Miami for years. Uh, in total, I have about fifteen years in the kitchen experience. Wow. Um, when I was cleaning a fryer, somebody had come into the kitchen behind me and yelled out, Hey, Jimmy. And when I turned, my hand had slipped into, you know, this 350, 400 degree grease. Oh. Uh, and I very quickly pulled the, the rag out of the grease and I was struck here on my chest and my, wow. my chin and my neck. And I had some pretty severe burns. Uh, small, lo you know, local scarring there, but nothing too dramatic. Um, and my, you know, I, I immediately started ripping my clothing off and jumping around, uh, you know, kind of in shock over it, but there wasn't really a lot of pain. 
I wonder why. <laughs> uh, you know, when you're on that stuff, you, you just can plow through anything and nothing mm -hmm. matters and you feel invincible. Um, so long story short, my boss come in and said, you have to go to the hospital. And I said, no way, man, look at me. Like I'm eyes wide open. I, I can't go to the hospital like this. And he said, look, just go tell them what happened. Bring me the bill. Cool. No problem. So I go to the hospital and uh, when you're under those fluorescent lights, doctors know what's happening. They're not stupid. They deal with this in the in eyes ER and all the yeah. time. Your activities, your movements, your eyes, right. the way that your facial expression is, the way the blood rushes to your face. There's so many indicators that you're on something for doctors. Even mm -hmm. when you're not, if you're in panic mode, they still ask you, have you taken any drugs? It's because they see it so commonly. Uh, in any case, this doctor very quickly put me in the, the bed and began rubbing uh, the silver dean on my burn areas and said that I, if I was lucky, I wouldn't have any scarring, uh, but that he was going to do a chest x-ray just to be safe. Uh, of course, I'm not going to tell the doctor no. Mm -hmm. uh, so he does the chest x-ray. I wait about 20, 30 minutes. He comes back and puts it up on the, the fancy light. And he said to me, do you see this NFL football sized thing in your chest that's pushing on your rib cage? And I said, yes. And he was like, that is your heart. Wow. At any moment, it could rupture and you die in about eight seconds, and there's no one in this building that could do anything about it. At the time, I had a one-year-old, um, and I was married to my first wife at the time, um, and this really shook me, it scared me. Um, and he said, I'm not gonna call the police, I'm not gonna report you, and I'm not gonna turn you away, but what I am gonna say is, if you continue down the path that you're on, no one will be able to save you, and you'll be dead in about mm. six to eight months. Uh, that, that really affected me. Um, to yeah, I can see you connecting with that now. Like it, it still it impacts. I think you. about it every day. Yeah. I don't think there is a, and I owe that doctor my life mm -hmm. for just saying those things. For saying the truth. Well, for calling attention to the fact that I was risking my life. You don't think you are in the moment. You know, you think you're just having a good time. You think you're, you know, if you're selling, you're making money, right? Like there's, I'm doing this for my family. There are loads of justifications that we give ourselves mm. as addicts because we want to keep doing whatever it is that we're doing. But this doctor said that to me and I thanked him very much and then I, I left. And because I was pretty strung out at the time, it didn't hit me until the next day. Uh, that, that morning I got out of bed around two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, I, I guess in the afternoon, not the morning. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I told my, my wife, I, I think we need to go. I think we need to, to just disappear you know, for a while. Uh, and we drove up out to, of Miami. yeah, out of Miami. Mm -hmm. So we, we drove up to Tennessee to see my family. Um, and when I got there, my uncle at the time owned a powder coating plant. It was essentially a manufacturing plant that powder coated metal goods. Uh, it's basically like dry paint, right? They, I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's a, it's, it's a manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. And he said, you should consider moving up here. I'll give you a job. Wow. You'll be, you'll be okay. I'll make sure you make enough money to live. Uh, my uncle Bobby, shout out to you. Uh, you saved saved my life. Um, so we went back to tennis to, to Miami, and a week later, I packed up everything that I owned on a truck and disappeared from South Florida forever. And when I left the sign that said "Now Leaving Dade County," I remember getting out and looking at that sign and feeling free. Mm. Uh, and 16 hours later, we were in Maryville, Tennessee, uh, population 30,000 <laughs> in total. Wow. Uh, and living on farmland. Um, and what I realized was that I was not happy with my life in general. My, my sobriety in that moment, in those moments, uh, really changed my perspective on what I wanted out of life overall. Uh, and I, I realized I was not happy with my current wife. I was not happy with my current living situation. Um, and, I, and I left. Mm. I, I I left my family. I just I just walked away from it forever. Your wife and your one year old. That's right. Wow. Um, that must uh, have been a really hard decision to make. You know, it was. Uh, you know, I, I I could probably get into the nitty gritty details of it, and it would it would be a tough conversation to have. But in the end, I made the decision to try and change myself, mm. and I couldn't do it attached to the person that I was with. Now, you know. To be clear, I'd never had any intention of like leaving my children. Um, in, the, in the time that we had moved to Tennessee, we had my son, my son, James Tyler. Um, and he was one, my, my daughter was three at the time. Uh, but walking away from that was this catalyst for what would happen to me over the course of the next 
10 to 11 years, um, I ended up meeting another person. Uh, we built a life together. She had two kids of her own. Uh, they're my stepkids. Uh, we've been together 11 years now. I went back to college and got a degree. <clears throat> I've built Say What Sales. I worked at Cirrus Insight for four years. I've been noted entity in the SaaS space. Mm. Uh, I have a, a whole career that I'm very proud of. Uh, lots of people love and support me. And it all happened because that doctor said what he said. And I go back to that just about every day. Had it not been for that doctor at South Miami Hospital, I would not be alive today, I don't think. Was it because you were scared for your own life or did you do it for your one-year-old kid at the time? What, or, or maybe both? Probably a little bit of both. If I had to be honest with you now, uh, which I always am, I, I don't think I know why. I don't, th I don't think I was necessarily afraid. I don't think it was for anyone. I just knew that I wanted to live. I knew that I wanted to see more of the world. I knew I wanted more out of life and that I wasn't going to get it if I stayed on this path. Mm -hmm. uh, so because that was my thought process, it was a really easy decision for me when I got back from Tennessee, back to Miami to say, let's get the truck, let's load everything up, we're out of here for good. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that really was the best decision that I ever made was removing myself from the environment that I had held so dear because it provided me with this vice that was killing me slowly. Where, where do you think that vice came from? Like I, I, I've shared before where mine came from as sure. a result of trauma. Yeah. Is, it, is it something you believe you were born with, childhood, trauma? Like where, where do you think no, it developed? No, I, I got into drug use, heavy drug use, really early when I was around... Uh, 11, I started smoking pot mm -hmm. uh, pretty heavily. Uh, and then I started smoking uh, cigarettes. And then before I knew it, I was drinking. Um, you know, in, in Miami, it was you know, really easy to get all these things because mm -hmm. it's Miami, right? It's like a party city. Uh, so nobody questions anything. You have to look even remotely close to 21 and we're selling you anything you want at the, right. at the, <laughs> at the convenience stores. So, uh, you know, it started off with like, you know, weed and cigarettes and Mad Dog 2020s and mm -hmm. Sane Ides, you know, like just the kid stuff that you do. Uh, and then I remember the first time I was offered cocaine, I remember saying like, I don't know, you know, I, I have allergy problems and, you know, this might not be for me. And, you know, just try it was kind of my thought process. Uh, and I was working as a bar back at a place called the Chili Pepper in Coconut Grove, Miami, Florida. Uh, and it was a nightclub. Uh, before I knew it, I was buying 20 bags and then I was buying two 20 bags and and then I couldn't wait to get to work so mm -hmm. that I could buy as much as, as I could afford to buy. Yeah. Uh, and that that became the norm for me for about a year. Uh, that spiraled out of control. I, I started doing so much cocaine that it, it wouldn't do it for me anymore and I didn't feel like I was getting that high that I wanted. So, of course, I picked up crack and then uh, I lived in an area that was separated. Uh, we had Douglas Road in Coconut Grove was the dividing line between the wealthy and the poverty. But the two were next door to each other community wise. So it was really easy to find people that had whatever you whatever it is you wanted, which eventually led me to start trying things like heroin. Um, and uh, in the past, I had done things like acid and ecstasy, so drug use in general. Uh, I like to tell people, I should say, I often tell people, my drug of choice was yes. Mm. Whatever you have on the board. Garbage can. That's right. It, didn't, <laughs> it did not matter what it was. If right. I could do it, I was going to do it uh, and see what it was like. Um, you know, I never got into, there were a couple that I stayed away from, like methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. I never got into that. Um, and now there's some stuff on the market now that I've never even heard of. Like I don't, I don't yeah. know. I've been I've been so detached from that world for so long. Right. Uh, telling this story even is like kind of nostalgic for me because I you know I tell the story a lot, but not in this setting. You know. So let's let's go deeper than the drugs. Sure. I think many of our audience will have an idea of, of who James Buckley is today. Mm -hmm. Who was James back then? How did he show up? Yeah. What, who, who was he? Uh, he was an angry kid. I was very violent. I got in a lot of fights. Um, I, I never shied away from a confrontation. I, w I never wanted to find a peaceful way out. It was immediately like, okay, well, what do you want to do? You want to go outside? Um, and it wasn't until my parents got divorced 
I was about 15 when that happened, that it really, you know, started spiraling out of control. And I didn't feel like I was being held accountable for anybody. So that mentality of like aggression and anger was, it was really easy for me to just let that go out. And I had been in martial arts for some time. So I was relatively skilled. Yeah, you had the tools as well. I, yeah, I had the tools. I knew I could. I had the confidence, you know. Uh, and because I had that confidence, there was no way that I was going to back down from anything. And that really led me down that path of heavy drug use because there was no fear. And I always thought, no matter what it is, I can overcome it. I can do better. I can, mm. I can get through it. Uh, and it turned out I couldn't. And it took that traumatic event I described and that, uh, that you know, near-death experience, I like to say, uh, now, I, I didn't OD. I didn't pass out. I wasn't on ventilators. They didn't pump my stomach. Uh, you know, so some people have different variations of what OD mm. looks like. Your experience is still valid. My experience is still valid. Exactly. And I still felt that same impact when I got up the next day and thought, what am I doing? And I remember very clearly, uh, you know, I, I went from working in kitchens to being a bouncer. Mm. at nightclubs so that I could be more close to that life mm. because it's really easy to get in that life. You can get anything you want at the nightclubs in Miami, anywhere, you know? Uh, and I started doing that for a living and that really transformed who I was as a person because now I wasn't a cook anymore. I was somebody that my job was confrontation. Right. Right. So now I'd, I'd come to work and I would do as much blow as I could uh, I would do as much dope as I could that would get me amped, you know, any mm. kind of speed would like rah, make me feel like I was going to do a good job tonight, you know, work in the door. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, it's just, it's an insane mind frame looking back at it now. I, I've heard several times in the journeys we take, every action that we take, it either takes us a step towards recovery or towards relapse. Yeah. And in, in general in life, is it a step towards connection or is it a, a step towards disconnection? Uh, and it sounds like certain steps you made there, like with the bouncer move and so on, um, you're continuing to take steps towards that unhealthiness. Yeah. So you've shared already uh, about moving, about making uh, a family change. What are some of the other steps you've made towards recovery and towards connection? Like what, what's worked for you? So I think, I think the thing that's worked for me the most is just a constant mindfulness of resistance. The inclination, any recovering addict will tell you that even 13 years later, in my case, I wake up every morning and when my feet hit the ground, the first thought I have is I'm not going to do cocaine today. Mm. Uh, that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their mind around that have never had an addiction like that. Uh, but I think that mentality of just a constant mindfulness of what I'm going through and why I'm going through it and how I'm going to resist that temptation every day has helped me the most. Um, I didn't do a lot. I, my, my experience with programs and group and therapy was very different. I, because my parents got, had a lot of problems internally when I was very young, I spent most of my childhood in group therapy and mm -hmm. family therapy. I knew exactly what people wanted to hear from me. And that made it really easy for me to score. So you had you like know? a mask on. like All the wanted, time. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. It's there was ti tiring. Very tiring. But you don't realize it's tiring because mm. you're on cocaine and you're never tired when you're right. on that stuff. Right. Uh, but, but my experience in family therapy really helped me in my recovery because at the time you're taking all this information in. You don't realize how helpful it is. And then suddenly, in your sobriety, you begin to think clearly. Mm. And then all those subconscious lessons begin to flood back. Uh, so a focus on communication really helped. If I was struggling that day or that night or uh, whatever, being able to have somebody to reach out to and say, you know, hey, I just kind of want to talk. Are you free? You know, do you want to go out? Do you want to go catch a movie? Do you want to go have dinner? Uh, you know, that, that stuff was always really helpful for me. Uh, but you know, the, the need never goes away. The, the want, the desire to do whatever it is your drug of choice is doesn't mm -hmm. go away. Uh, it's, it's with you forever. I think we move past that only when we choose to. Mm -hmm. And I chose to move past it when I started helping other people understand what I went through, telling them about the mistakes that I made, like leaving my first wife and not considering my children. Mm. Right, that was a very clouded decision on my part because my recovery was a mess at the time. A lot of self. 
a lot of self and, and it's a very selfish act. I mean, let's, let's be honest, right? Like not a lot of people out there are willing, not a lot of dads that don't have direct access to their children are willing to come on this platform, this show and be like, yeah, I left my wife and kids. Like it doesn't, doesn't happen very often. And mm. the reason it doesn't happen very often is because they're worried about that condemnation mm. that they might receive, that judgment that they might get from anybody and everybody that's out there. But I love my children. Uh, and I'll do anything for them. And it's unfortunate the way that it unfolded. Uh, you know, there is a whole story behind that as well that's probably best left for another time. Uh, but one day they will come to me. One day they'll be adults and mm -hmm. they'll have questions. And I'll be able to tell them, no, it was best for you mm -hmm. that I wasn't in your life at that time. And it's best for you that you see me in this light now. And because I took that time away from you and made something of myself, I can now provide for you what I should have been providing all that time. So I looked at it from this perspective. If you had a son, a daughter that came to you and said, Dad, I married this person and they're miserable every day. And because of that, I'm miserable every day. And no matter what I do, I can't make them happy. Would you look at your son or daughter and say, well, you married him, stick it out? Mm. No, no self-respecting parent would say that. They'd say what any parent should say. Maybe you have to make you happy before you can make anyone else happy. Yeah. And that's what I did. I went and I made myself happy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I relate. My, my dad got remarried a few years before he passed. And I know my sister really struggled with that. Yeah. And, um, you know, perhaps changing the relationship that they had. But my mentality I had was I just want him to be happy uh, rather than you know, same as I look at my re his relationship with my mom. They were both unhappy to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't hold I hold a little bit of anger, but there's some of it which is, is like they were just doing the best that they could. Um, I, it, it's a challenge. I think it certainly has an impact. And, and I'm, it sounds like you're aware that it probably will have an impact on your kids. Oh, definitely. Uh, I think it has an impact on them right now, every day. I don't talk to them very often because my ex-wife and I don't have the best relationship. Uh, and that's as, that's as much as I say about that. I am not a person that will badmouth their mother. I don't think that that's doing anyone any good. Mm. Instead, I'll wait for them to come to me. I'll wait for them to ask. I mean, Google my name, I'm everywhere, right? It's easy to find me. So... Uh, you know, she limits the time that they have online because that's right. the case. I can't change that from over here. She lives in South Carolina. I live in Tennessee. I, when, that, when that happened in the courtroom, I thought, you know, that's terrible. And I don't agree to that. It turned out to be a really good thing. We were so toxic for one another that it was a better option for them to, for her to be as far away from me as possible. Yeah. At the moment, you think this judge is allowing this woman to take my children from me far away. Uh, but 10 years down the line, 13 years later, I can tell you that had it not been for that distance, I don't think I'd be the person I am. I don't think that I would have made it through college. I don't think that I would have the patience that I've grown to have because sh she was a test for me. Yeah. You know, knows how somebody that knows how to push your buttons, somebody that knows how to get a rise out of you, somebody that knows how to say things to you that really hurt you. Mm, uh, push those buttons. That's right. That's what I had at school. I was thinking about this recently. Like I was trying to think, why was I bullied at school? Mm -hmm. And and I'm still thinking about it. But it's because they knew how to push my buttons and that they'd get a reaction out of me. And and there's uh, some intensity and some drama to that. And people like some people like that. Yeah, I you know, it's funny. I was a bully. Uh, when I was in school, my dad was pretty physical. Um, he was kind of a mean dude. And I thought that's how you were supposed to be. Hurt people, hurt people. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put a label on him like he was, you know, a monster or mm -hmm. anything. But he had his moments where abuse was there. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I was a bully because of that factor. But I know that it contributed to my justification of it. I know that I thought, well, this is just kids. You know, um, so when I started working at the nightclubs, obviously you're yeah. seeing people that <laughs> right. you went to high school with. Well, right. uh, went to junior high, high school with. Um, I had many instances where I would see people that I bullied and I would say to them, hey, I just want you to know I'm sorry. Wow. For like what I did to you. And that's, it's inexcusable. Mm. And some people were really nice about it. Oh, it's okay. Kids are kids. But other people would straight up say, you know, you need to get away from me mm. now. And I had to understand that, 
right? Now this is prior to leaving. I still had the problem, yeah. but I was becoming more aware that the person I was wasn't someone I wanted to be anymore. Right. Uh, and I remember working at a, a strip bar called Scarlet's and I did a line off of a dirty toilet in a bathroom stall. Wow. And I remember standing up and saying, what am I doing? Mm. Like, this is not a good life for me. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that I went to Tennessee and, you know, yeah. had the experience I had. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at it in chronological order, there's just so much, you know. So let, let, let's look at support a little bit. Sure. Um, so I know for me, when I had my breakdown in New York City, middle of 2017, I had my manager there, my manager's manager there, people that work for me there, co-workers there, and a lot, a lot of people witnessed it. And that created a lot of shame and guilt. Yeah. Now, how have your experiences shaped how you would react in that situation? Because I was extremely lucky to have, from a management perspective, people that could see through the surface level stuff mm -hmm. and be able to support. So how would you approach that, that sort of situation? Like how do you show up for other people? Uh, so to answer your first question and how I deal with shame, uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of shame. I feel that my experiences have not afforded me that luxury of shame. Uh, so I say what I say with great gusto and confidence because it's who I am. Uh, and how I show up for other people is I am very open about my mistakes that I've made. And I, I like the question, <laughs> do you want me to help coach or listen? Mm. Uh, because I feel like people often generalization the the people that that I come in contact with that come to me for advice help career stuff whatever um, those those people need to be clear about what they need because it's going to impact the way that I respond if you want me to tell you a story about something similar that I went through that you've gone through I can do that but if you want me to tell you what you should do that's a totally different kind of conversation in a lot of cases, I find myself being even more upfront and saying, man, that's really unique. I wish I had something to say to you about it. Uh, let me do some thinking on it and I'll get mm. back to you, right? Uh, so that's how I show up for people is I'm extremely real about what I can offer them. Uh, and I think that makes a big difference in the way that, the way that they perceive it. Because most people come with you know, whatever it is they come with. And we have a tendency as people that have been through it, people that know recovery, people that have gone through a program of some kind, uh, people that are currently in a program, we want to immediately throw up all the things that we have learned in that moment and think it's going to impact this individual that's never taken that journey before. Mm. <laughs> and because they've never taken those steps, what we're saying is rather foreign to them, mm. right? Uh, I, and I think I approach them in that way too, knowing that this is a what I refer to as a blind person, right? Somebody that's not awake yet, somebody that's still living with whatever stigma they might be living with, whatever burden they might be carrying. Uh, so my words are very surface level until I've earned the right to go deeper. And I always want to earn that right before I dive too deep. Right. And I think another, in my experience, another type of blind person is when they say, this is the only way to get sober. This is, this is what sobriety is, <laughs> yeah. i.e. pure abstinence from right. everything. And the only way to get sober is by following X. Mm -hmm. Now, I know uh, you've shared with me um, the importance of your own journey in terms of how you define your recovery and your sobriety and That's right. the programs you work. So I, I've shared for me what um, the program I work um, but not everyone will be able to relate to that. So what works for you? Yeah, so uh, it, it's different now than it was 13 years ago when I started on this journey to recovery, right? Um, what worked for me was removing myself from the environment entirely. Uh, Miami was a place that I heavily regarded as the cocaine capital of the US, right? Uh, and because of that, it was very, very easy for me to fall back into it. Every time I went home to visit, I would be exposed mm. like a nerve, right? And it was a test of like, can I resist? And honestly, through a lot of time, I, uh, uh, many times I went back to visit my family, I, I didn't resist and it was t tough for me. But 
I remember a moment where I went back home and it was in my face and I don't know what changed. I wish I, I wish I had a defining moment that said, oh, that happened and that's why. I don't have that. But someone offered me what they offered me mm -hmm. and I just said, no thanks, man, that's you. Well, I'm good. And from that point on, that was my canned response every time I was offered something that I knew I couldn't do mm -hmm. or that I couldn't do just one of, you know, yeah. like it's not gonna work that way. Uh, and now it's gone even further than that. Like I, I gave up all the hard dope. I, I even quit smoking cigarettes after 20 years of being a smoker. Like, wow. you know, when you think about giving up bad habits, that's meant to be one of the hottest ones to kick. It uh, was harder. Nicotine. It was harder than some of the the drugs I, right. I came off of. You know, I, I, you know that. That's just a testament to you know 13, 12, 12 years later. I'm coming up on two years being free of cigarettes. You know, wow. free of nicotine altogether. When you look at that, and you think back to what you used to do, like I recall nights, you know, being a heavy cocaine user where you're smoking two, three packs of cigarettes a night, just because you know you just can't stop. Uh, but what worked for me was completely changing my environment. Mm -hmm. That was the catalyst for everything that happened afterwards. Because after removing yourself from the environment that you associate heavily with your addiction, there's nothing but new. Mm. There's nothing but a choice. There's nothing but, you know, interesting life things that you recognize that you probably wouldn't have <laughs> if you had stayed down there and kept doing the things you were doing. Uh, I was amazed at the way that I enjoyed food again. Mm -hmm. I was amazed at the fact that I could drink without the purpose of getting drunk mm. now. Uh, I was amazed at the fact that I didn't have an inclination to go search, right? We, we as I as an addict spent a lot of time searching. Mm. You, don't, you don't think you do until you're an addict and then you're not. And then you realize that you spent quite a bit of time looking for that thing that got you off, whatever it is. Right. Uh, but not having that burden, not having that anchor allowed me to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And it turned out my, my, my current wife put me in school uh, a couple of years after we met and I, she, I, I was really mad. I was, I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to college. Like, right. what are you talking about? I'm about 30 years old, like 29 at the time. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to college. That's crazy. Right. She said, just give me one semester. And if you don't like it, you can quit. Fast forward five years, I got my bachelor's degree, uh, transferred after two years over to a, a four-year college, got my bachelor's degree in writing communications. And it's a prestigious liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I landed at Cirrus Insight after graduation, and I was there for four years. Uh, and that's where I built Stay What Sales. Mm -hmm. uh, this past year, I, I'm here at Ringlead doing data management, data governance uh, for Salesforce and Marketo. And the career change for me, like imagine going from working the door at a nightclub to being a kitchen guy, and then this life here of software sales and data and like this big macro industry. People, people that knew me 20 years ago, if you asked them, where's James Buckley today, they would tell you dead or in prison. Wow. They would probably not tell you he's a successful speaker and does data and software and has this brand online that people respond to and like, mm. they wouldn't say those things. I would never have said those things about myself. This was not planned. Right. You know, the plan was to keep doing cocaine. The plan was to keep destroying what I had. The plan was to keep my family at bay because they gave a shit mm. and I didn't like that. It made me uncomfortable because they didn't like who I was at the time. All of it turned into what you see now. Just, just simply by removing myself from that environment. Uh, so, so yeah, that's how I show up. I tell people that story so consistently. You have, uh, uh, the title brand ambassador. That's right. Uh, both at Uncrushed at Ringlead. Um, and I, I remember when you did an interview on Make It Happen Mondays with mm -hmm. John Barrows, uh, who's a massive advocate, and, and we're very grateful for you, John. Um, he asked you the question of like, you're always so happy, you know, and <laughs> yeah. this, this really then opened up a, an opportunity for you to talk about the past. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think was different for you? Why, why do you think you chose that moment? Be because at least from the outside in, it seems like that's a turning point for you 
to then not only be a brand ambassador in software, but to really advocate for mental health and mental right. wellness? So uh, two things. One, John and I have known each other for a very long time, and I've always felt comfortable speaking to him. We, I had been on the show before talking about events and best practices and how to really get the most out of your sales event uh, or your marketing event that you're doing. Um, and he, I, I, Morgan J. Ingram, again, personal friend of mine, works for John now. Okay. Him and I had a relationship. Like we, we had a circle of trust already built. So when he asked that question, I wish I knew what triggered that in my mind to say, oh, I can tell John this. You know, and I absolutely realized that I was on his forum, on his stage, so to speak, in front of his audience, but I felt really comfortable telling him how I remain so happy. I have a great sense of retrospect. I can look back at my life in the past consistently and say, what would be better than that? Mm. And when he asked, what, what, how do you stay so happy? I said, I should be dead right now. I couldn't resist. That was... That was my response, and that is how I stay happy. I realize that so much has happened to me that I probably should be dead, right? Like, I, I, I am the poster child for somebody that's had so much crap happen to them in their lives, I dive into a bottle or a baggie, right? That, that is the opposite of what I did. So when he asked that, I unloaded. And mm. I, I don't, I don't, I, I have no idea why, but I felt very comfortable. Um, and of course, within hours after he shared that, that video, I had countless people that were reaching out to me. I just heard this show. You're incredible. I just heard the, the podcast, and I have a similar background. I'd love to chat sometime. Wow. I just heard the show, and it's changed my perspective. I have a drinking problem. It's not cocaine, I realize, but what you said really impacted me. There were so many people reaching out to me like that, and that's when I knew I had hit a nerve. Like, hey, I'm not alone right now, mm. right? There are countless people in my position and in other positions that are just as successful, and in some cases, way more successful than me, that are struggling with the same thing that I struggled with to get where I am today. We have those words in our Uncrushed video, you are not alone. You're not alone. They're really important words. They are important words. And I don't think people realize how important they are until they finally realize they're not alone. Mm. Like, you're not alone is something that people say, and it's, uh, I have a friend that calls some stuff like that a platitude, right? It's like just a, just a simple thing that you would say, like a cliche, mm -hmm. right? But in the mental health space, to say something like you are not alone, that impacts, that's a wave, it's a ripple that sends through that community of people that are suffering. And it was different because I've done, I had done shows before and people had reached out to me and been like, oh my gosh, I listened to your podcast with, you know, so-and-so with, with Will Barron and it was amazing and I love the way that you put this, that and the other and all those accolades are fantastic. But when you tell a story like mine on a forum like John's and people start coming to you with their emotions bared, I had people crying to me on the phone, mm. you know? That was extremely moving for me. And then I knew that I had made the right choice. It validated all the things I had been doing. It, it made me feel like I was on the right path because I was putting positive out there into the world. So why am I happy? I'm happy because I'm alive. Mm. I'm happy because even though my kids and I have this estranged relationship, they're alive and happy right? And safe. Um, I'm happy because we're here right mm. now doing this. This makes me happy. This makes me feel like I'm fulfilling a, a hole in my life that's been there all along. And I didn't know until John said, hey, why are you so happy? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I think when we talk about loneliness, it, for me, it's on a deeper level. Like I could stand in the middle of Manhattan and feel lonely. Uh, even though there's physically many people there, yeah, it's it's inside this disconnection. Well, so I was going to say that's right back to the connection. You know, John and I have always had a really strong connection. We I think we feel the same way about the sales industry, and that was our original connection. But it built into a friendship. It grew into a friendship, and then that conversation sort of changed our friendship in a way. Um, you know, telling him about my divorce and how that went, telling him all the moves my ex-wife made to make sure that I didn't have access to the kids and, you know, tell, poisoning their minds against me and all that stuff, right? Like just, just emptying all that stuff out onto a forum like John's. 
uh, it's interesting, right, to see the amount of people that come out of the woodwork and go, man, I had a similar experience. Mm. We think we're alone until we're not. We think that we are by ourselves until we look around and there's 2,500 people standing next to us, right? That's a very strange feeling in a very disconnected world. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about sales a little bit, you know, sure. um, pivoting on that word connection. Yeah. And I know there are many companies, many influencers who put out a lot of content for salespeople mm -hmm. to to be the best version of themselves, to be so successful at sales. And, and even in my roles, like it, it's been like, five tips to hit your quota, stuff like that. Yeah. How does this feed into how you and Uncrushed can help salespeople be successful? Yeah, I love this question, man. Thank you for asking it. Um, depression and anxiety and stress are mental issues that every salesperson deals with. There's and you no, talked about it with Tiffany as well, right? That's On right. Podcast. That's right. There is no escaping those feelings. Those feelings are there from the time you start every day to the time every day ends, whatever time that might be. And sometimes they're late. But I feel that talking about sales best practices, motivating people to be the best version of themselves that they can be, and giving them things that actually work and improve their chances of being successful, that alone fulfills a hole in my heart that could never be replaced by anything else. Mm. Nothing else could fill that hole. When I started Say What Sales, I started it because I wanted to put my journey out there. What, what is Say What Sales for people that aren't familiar with it? Sure. So I am historically noted for saying inappropriate things, you might have guessed. Um, so people will often say, say what? Like that, say what, right? And I loved that growing up. It was a big thing in the 80s and the early 90s. You know, that was like a phrase that you heard quite a bit. Uh, and people were always surprised at the way I would respond to clients and customers and prospects. They were always surprised, like, like, what did you say? Why would you say that? How would you say that? And I can't believe you said that, right? So Say What Sales was my personal brand that I came up with and I wanted to attach it to this element of this is my journey as a salesperson and here's all the things I'm learning as I get to where I'm going. Uh, and it'll never stop. They're small, consumable, one minute videos that are motivational, inspirational, informative, helpful. They're advice centered, they're career goals centered. Um, I, try, I try not to silo my content into something that's scripted. Almost every Say What Sales video that you see is done on the first take, so it's very authentic. There are not 20 versions of that video, and then I choose the best one, right? Based on your hair, right? Right, based on my hair <laughs> or the way that my face turns, right. or you can see this in, my, in the light, right? Like, I don't right. do that. For me, what you get is 100% real. That's what's missing in sales, right? Mm. Um, we honesty, honesty about what who we are and what we do. Mm. You see this in cold calls all the time. Somebody will call you. You don't know this person, uh, and their intro is just them vomiting their script on you. Same on LinkedIn, right? Same the on LinkedIn. Templated. It's like you're not even looking. Like, yeah, yeah. Where's the connection? Connect and pitch is a plague, mm. right? Um, but even more so than that, connect, and then I'm going to send you a novel. Yeah. Probably not great, <laughs> right? Uh, and I've had a lot of really interesting encounters with people where I challenge this quite regularly. I'll say to them, is this an automated message? Mm. That's my response. And you know how many people respond? None, because it is an automated message and because they don't want to admit it or because they're ashamed. Mm. You should be ashamed, right? Don't do this. This is There's a place for automation, but it is not in your relationships in the sales world. Right. So. Say what sales exists because there is no anchor for a North Star metric on how to build a strong sales career. There is only five tips to hit your quota. Mm. <laughs> and, right. and I don't subscribe to that because everything works. It's a matter of what works for you and your prospects. And you see this as a massive aspect of leading towards that North Star. I do, absolutely. I see mental health being a focus in sales, being something that every salesperson should be cognizant of. We should be conscious of how we feel. We should definitely take that anxiety, stress, and depression that comes along with our role and openly discuss it with our team, colleague, leaders. That part of being in sales is crucial for growth, development, both personally and professionally. Yeah, I and I know you uh, you did a great podcast with Tiffany. I did. Um, and talked about the, the uh, state of burnout in sales. I did. 
Um, for any sales professionals that are listening to this, and I'm catching myself because I've asked this question professionally <laughs> uh, to different thought leaders and influencers, but for any salespeople that are struggling right now uh, and listening to this podcast and perhaps are cautious or worried about coming forward and asking for help, what would be your advice from your experience? Yeah, so I have two pieces of advice that I typically give people that are struggling to feel that burnout. Uh, and the first thing I'll say is structure your time better. Um, that's a skill that a lot of early salespeople struggle with. And they wait a while before they begin to develop it. But I feel that it is an early skill that people need to have as soon as possible in sales because you're hired as a sales rep, but really what you are is a consultant, mm. a data manager, a data entry person, a analyst, a generalist, right? We wear a lot of hats as sales reps. So structuring your time accordingly and being able to wear all those hats in increments mm. and make it as effective as possible makes you feel less anxiety, makes you feel less stressed, makes you feel less burnt, right? Because you've allocated the time appropriately and you've executed on each time slot on your day. Um, and then the other tip that I would give them is guard your time. That's the hardest thing that we do. And I know many professionals of all kinds of industries, not just sales, that really struggle with this. Um, your personal and professional relationships suffer greatly at the hands of exhaustion mm. um, because we feel like this deadline is so important. Well, that deadline will probably be there tomorrow. Yeah. You know? So those are my two pieces of advice for people that are struggling with burnout. Um, and then voice it. You know, I guess there's like a third caveat there, right? Voice that burnout. There's nothing wrong with telling your immediate supervisor, I I'm burnt. I, I need some time. And what about wider than burnout? So perhaps someone that, you know, you, you shared some of your challenges, so perhaps someone that's struggling with addiction. What would, what would you recommend? So for addiction, I think it's best to turn to your family first because I think that my family was cornerstone in supporting my recovery even though it was kind of under the table and didn't involve a 12-step program and, you know, didn't have a facility attached to it or anything like, or doctors. Uh, but they were so proud that I had taken that step. And I know that anyone out there that has an addiction of any kind, someone out there loves you and cares for you and is saddened to see you going through this. Mm. So go to that person, flock to that person, that group of people, <coughs> and let them, you know, wrap their love around you so that you know. That unconditional love. Absolutely. I mean, no, no. So first of all, no, my mother is my best friend and we really had a rocky relationship for a long time. Mm. My father died from Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and one of the last things he said to me was, above everything, respect your mother. Mm. And that changed our relationship in a huge way. It wasn't long after that that I left my first wife. I was mad at my mother for years for leaving my father for another man. Well, that man is a great man. Mm. And he's, he's one of my closest friends now. I consider him my father. Think about the juxtaposition there. Mm -hmm. Think about how that transition might have taken place over the course of time. Right. Right? It took me a long time to realize, and an experience very similar to my mother's, to where I called her and said, I'm so sorry for everything that I put you through. I, I know now what, what you've done mm -hmm. and why. And now she's my, first of all, my number one fan. Shout out to you, mom. I love you. Mm -hmm. Right? And then also, she is a huge supporter of all the movements that I'm doing. No initiative that I've taken has not been supported by my mom, my family, my sisters, right? They were the people that were consistently telling me, I'm so proud of you. You're doing so well. I'm so pleased to see you on this path. I can't believe you're getting a college degree, <laughs> right? That was not in my life plan. It's bringing up a lot for you there. It does, yeah, mm. because, because you think in, in the beginning of your recovery, you think, I'm a piece of garbage. Mm. Everyone does because we're, we're adjusting, right? We're starting a new life. We're, we're beginning a new path. We're carving a new way that wasn't there before. Yeah. And we don't feel worthy of that new way. Um, imposter syndrome is huge for me. I'm very conscious of that. Um, 
recognize that you are not an imposter. You're, you're fine the way you are, right? Uh, that's a huge reckoning for people of, of any age bracket, of any industry, when it comes to addiction. You know, you're normal. This mm. is okay. You can get through it, and that's the thing that matters the most. That's a hard part for a lot of people to deal with. And then, of course, I have lots of advice for people that deal with stress and anxiety and depression. Yeah. I've been through a lot of those as well. I think the beauty with family as well is it doesn't necessarily have to be blood. I think a, a lesson that I learned is that you can pick your family. That's right. And uh, I know one of the co-founders on Crush, Janelle, um, really talks about her personal board of directors and picking these people that, that, uh, that she trusts. Yeah. Um, so you've interviewed a number of people on the Uncrush podcast. Yeah. What are some of the takeaways for you from different episodes that you've recorded? Oh, so many good ones. I've had some great ones. Um, so I really liked MK and Molly's Gremlins conversation. You had some Gremlins the other week. Do I you sure that? do. And yeah. we all do, right? right? Like, man, the Gremlins in my head are beastly. Mm. Um, I, I also really liked Jenny Gaither's Core 4 commentary. Mm. I thought... So I, I d didn't even know I have a core four, but I do. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. I thought that was great. Um, and then I really enjoyed just yesterday, I interviewed James Cardamone. I said his name right. Mm -hmm. Hey, James, I got it right. Uh, <laughs> I got that. I, I got his, his version of family is probably one of the more touching that I've seen. Uh, he's Italian. Italians, historically, very tight-knit mm -hmm. group, right? Yeah. Um, and his family had been supportive through all of his ups and downs. Uh, and I won't, I won't give away anything for the, for the episode when it airs, but uh, I'll tell you that that dynamic of unconditional love is very evident in his story and how his family supported him coming out of his recovery and you know, building a better life. Um, and then with Tiffany Bova, I mean, my God, that woman is just full of knowledge. Mm. There's so much value in a 20 minute, 30 minute conversation with her about business, how, it's, how teams function, um, how mental health and stress and anxiety and burnout impact teams' performances. Mm. That was one of the more interesting conversations I think I've ever had. Um, and then I, I really enjoy it when I can sit across from somebody and I can see that simpatico you know like we feel the same way about something you and i share that with right. our fathers we share that with addiction we share that with family we share that with isolation mm. right like that i so feel like that the vulnerability from casey from teji from richard from Lindsay, like yeah so many people sharing that connection with you that's right and you know i think that's probably my favorite thing about every guest we've had is that i connect with them on such a deep level in this setting mm. for the world to see Right, it can happen. We still connect with each other. It's not all robots and AI. Right, <laughs> right. This stuff is the stuff that propels people forward through the tougher times. Um, learning to deal with confrontation is something we learn to do with others, but learning how to do it with ourselves is really difficult. And the stories that my guests on the Uncrushed podcast have told encourage folks to have that self-confrontation so that they can begin a conversation. I, I do a weekly uh, a, a meditation called pranayama, which is a breathing breathwork meditation. And each week uh, we have to set an intention. And the, the therapist's intention is always to hold a safe space uh, for people's emotions to come forward. And um, I think this is really important for managers that are listening here. Mm. Uh, what I see is what you're doing on the Uncrush podcast, and in general, what we do at Uncrush is we're creating a space for people to come forward and to be honest. And uh, I know this is something that's really important to you, right? For how how can managers not necessarily just talk, but create a safe space? So, so this is this is really important to me because I've had a lot of managers, and I've been a manager, and if we don't care for the well-being overall of our team members, they won't, they won't buy into us as a successful manager. Mm. And we need that buy-in in order to create a culture of acceptance. We need that buy-in in order to create a culture of wellness in our team. And if we don't have that, how, product, how productive will that team be? Much less 
productive if they didn't feel like you were vested in their well-being overall. So uh, lots of different ways to start that conversation. Lots of uh, relationship building has to take place. Lots of one-on-ones need to happen before you can just dive into somebody's mental health, right? But at the same time, if we don't start having these conversations, that mental health will eventually surface in a negative way. And there is a way to discuss mental health positively. Mm. There is a way to create awareness on your team, you know, teach people how to recognize signs of burnout, depression, and anxiety, and respond accordingly so that they feel like you have their best interest in mind. I think Uncrushed has an opportunity to do that for teams all over the world. Being able to come out, talk to a team about what we've gone through and tell them that what they're doing matters and we need it to be something that they are comfortable doing and these mental health challenges that they're struggling with, in some cases for years, months, Mm. you know, it's not something that takes place overnight. Uh, that's a conversation I think more managers need to have. Uh, the downside to it is that when you call attention to something as sensitive as mental health, sometimes there's some pushback from other departments, other leaders. That's okay. It's good to know that those folks feel that way so that they don't have to be involved in the conversation. The last thing that we need is to be having a conversation at a team-wide level and have somebody in senior leadership shut the conversation down for fear of something unreasonable like a lawsuit. Yeah. You know, we, we, If you want the best for your employees, then there should be no qualms about having this conversation out loud in front of your entire team. I'm not saying let's all go out there and air out our dirty laundry <laughs> as managers. Right. What I am saying is that the message has to be, we give a shit. Right. And as long as that's the message, I feel like we'll, we're in better shape as teams. So uh, as we wrap up this episode of the Uncrush podcast, any closing thoughts for our listeners? So many. Um, please reach out to me. I want your story. I, in fact, I, I need to hear it because it validates everything that we're doing here. Uh, if, if you've ever suffered from a mental health problem, if it's a challenge, if it's something that you've often wanted to get off your chest and you need a stranger to listen, I got the ear for you. So, uh, you know, let me hear it. That's my message to you out there. You're not alone. We can help. I want to change the way that your team functions by improving their mental status. Thank you. And, um, and thank you for all you've done for, for me. In my, and I, I can out without that. Like, thank you. Yeah. Um, Oh, that hit me then. <laughs> uh, and, and thank you for all you do for Uncrushed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a tough job sitting in this seat and creating this sp- safe space. And you do it beautifully. Thank you. Um, and I, I think wrapping this up, like what is so beautiful is you started this podcast talking about the scars. And I don't see the scars. And I see a really beautiful person. And um, it's great just to see all you give back to the community. Thanks, man. So... Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, James. And uh, make sure to check out other episodes of the Uncrushed podcast. You can go to uncrushed.org forward slash podcast and subscribe on all the popular channels.